Byard's early days of activism were infused with religious fervor and unflinching courage. His earliest protest took place in his hometown, Westchester, Pennsylvania, when as a teenager he challenged the segregated seating policy at the local Warner movie theater. His commitment to the nonviolent struggle for equality and social justice stemmed from the values instilled in him by his grandmother, Julia Davis Rustin, who had been reared in a Quaker household where her mother was a servant. Julia also had attended a local Quaker school, and although she joined the local African Methodist Episcopal Church upon marriage, those early Quaker values were the motivations for her own activism in Westchester. Later, when Bard moved to New York, he aligned himself with the Fellowship of Reconciliation, then a Christian-based anti-war organization espousing the, the principles of nonviolence based not only on Christ's Sermon on the Mount, but also on the writings of Leo Tolstoy, our own Henry David Thoreau, and a then very current visible presence on the world stage, Mohandas Gandhi. Early on, Bard and a small cadre of like-minded activists at the FOR saw the potential of mass nonviolent protest as a way of challenging racial segregation in the U.S. However, in the early days, the, quote, mass, unquote, often was a small group of radical pacifists, committed, courageous, and willing to subject themselves to the violence of diehard segregationists and sometimes police, ready to face incarceration for violating Jim Crow laws in restaurants, theaters, hotels, and on public transportation. And although they had supporters, often from local churches, colleges, and universities, and civil rights groups, the number of people willing to risk arrest, beatings, and possible death was relatively small. The 1963 march had sim similar radical roots. Although it was to evolve into a massive demonstration, at that time the largest in our nation's history, it grew out of a three-page memo drafted by Bayard, Norman Hill, and Tom Kahn, two younger activists. The original memo called for a two-day action to address the crisis of unemployment and poverty in the black community and was drawn up at the request of Ethel Philip Randolph, who had been envisioning a march since the early 1940s. Among the initial ideas were essentially a massive sit-in, <coughs> if you will, in the offices of the members of Congress, presenting them with a list of legislative demands, but essentially preventing them from conducting business as usual. Simultaneously, a smaller group of leaders would meet with the president to discuss the same demands. The, object, the objectives here, thus, were based on economic issues and were not necessarily race-based. As the memo stated, quote, we now demand a program of action in 1963 that will ensure the emancipation of all labor, regardless of color, race, or creed. And as Mr. Randolph, Preston, and Hill, and Kahn knew, any movement based on the goals of full employment and the elimination of poverty would help the black community most, since it was disproportionately represented among the poor and unemployed. But something happened between January and June of 1963, when the march opened its national headquarters in Harlem. Despite several years of little activity on the question of civil rights legislation, the growing unrest in the South in the early 1960s, the freedom rides, the sit-ins, and the refusal to move on school integration Birmingham demonstrations that summer, all motivated President John F. Kennedy to introduce a civil rights bill. So what was essentially a demonstration based on economic issues became the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. This was not merely a change in name, but one that profoundly influenced the development of the demonstration, both in its tactics and outreach. It essentially moved from being a labor action to one that could also be embraced by the major civil rights organizations, such as the NAACP and the National Urban League, both of which had large membership bases and chapters across the country. But their involvement did not come without a cost. To bring in the groups that had largely middle-class constituents, some of the more radical tactics 
though not necessarily the rhetoric, would have to be shelved. While many would be willing to join their local NAACP chapter, church group, sorority, fraternity, labor union, in joining forces at the Lincoln Memorial for a program of inspiring speeches and uplifting musical performances, few would be willing